done regionally two or three times. It was a dust by any other name it was called. A dust by... But it was more fantasy, oh. though it involved a science fiction genre thing. Thanks, uh, Roland. Ready? Science fiction uh, on television might be considered a branch of uh, science fiction in the film. They're both uh, dealing with the uh, medium of ideas in uh, this area in the visual sense. Uh, and certainly the, the name of uh, Rod Serling has been very closely associated with, uh, with science fiction on television. What was your first uh, encounter with... Uh, the first Maybe. serious encounter in, t in uh, television science fiction form, Jim, would have been... Uh, I'm having a lot of trouble with that cigarette, <laughs> aren't I? I think God is telling me, don't smoke. Uh, a fairly obscure show that people don't remember called The Desi Luke Playhouse. This was back in about, oh, I'd guess, 1956. Uh, and I did a time travel piece with Bill Bendix, uh, the name of which, strangely enough, eludes me at this given moment, though I should remember it. It was the first shot out of the... Oh, the time element, it was mm -hmm. called. And got tremendous reaction. And because of its reaction, the network, the CBS network, who I had approached over the past three years to try to get something in the science fiction genre on, took another second look at it. And as a result, I got Twilight Zone on. But that time travel thing was the first essentially serious thing I had done. What led you to, to this field? Or... Of course, see, I love science fiction, but I'm an aficionado, not a contributor. And I say this, you know, with no stupid, dumb, dumb humility at all. I'm a, purely a Johnny-come-lately. I am perhaps the least scientifically knowledgeable man in the whole writing group, and I bow with great deference and respect to the real masters, uh, you know, Asimov and, and Bob Hanline and Sturgeon and all the rest of them. And these, of course, and yourself included, because you write pure science fiction. I can adapt science fiction, I think, quite adequately, but I can't create it on an original level. What's the difference when you come to adapt something? Well, of course... What do you look for? I look for that which is shootable and that which is tellable in storyline in, in at least a reasonably simple form because television, however ambitious it may be and however vast is the, the realm of imagination that you can dabble in, is still a strangely limited and, and closed and closeted kind of medium. We can do marvelous interiors of spaceships, but we, we fall by the wayside in the area of opticals when it comes to, you know, extraterrestrial space travel and that sort of thing. We, for example, could never begin to do 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, Kubrick would put us out of business in three days of shooting. Uh, so, as a result, we're sort of the poor relation of, uh, of science fiction in the mass media. And you'll note that most of the science fiction that is tackled on television is bedroom and living room science fiction. Small scale. Small lab and small scale. Mm -hmm. So you look for a... I uh, look for tellable stories that are physically tellable, and from a plot point of view, that which is uh, at least pliable, manipulable. Manipulable. <laughs> you know what I mean, yes, sir, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yes, I... Uh, he writes I... well, it doesn't, he doesn't talk very good, you know. <laughs> the, the question, really, I, I guess I'm trying to get at is, um, if one has this, uh, presumably, a tellable story, one which is tellable on television, one which uh, is uh, capable of being handled in these small-scale terms, which don't demand large visual effects. What would then distinguish something in this group? Say you have a group of stories. What do you look for that uh, you think will go get across with this particular audience, the television audience, in terms of, of the imaginative feel that science fiction mm. represents? Of course, I'd, I'd have to preface my response by, by saying that I, don't, I think the, net regs, the networks have have traditionally and almost ritualistically shortchanged the science fiction audience, both qualitatively and quantitatively. I don't think, number one, they've given the proper respect to science fiction as a legitimate area of literary uh, attempt. Uh, so number one, I think, first of all, it's a high-level literary form. And number two, I think it's much more than a small coterie of loyal viewers who have read amazing stories and want to go on. I think it's a sizable group, particularly amongst the young, particularly because we live in a society which is so technologically improved and which is so scientifically oriented now that, indeed, this is simply a reflection of what is the time around us now. But if I had a group of stories to select, I think by virtue of its mass media form, 
I would try to choose those stories that, though even science fiction and genre, would be tellable in terms of the most acceptable human terms that we now know. I would probably shy away from the year 2500. I would much rather deal in 1998. The hardware that I use, I think, should be identifiable. Different, of course, because it changes every year. But I would be more prone to think in terms of, I'd like to know what happens Thursday, not in the next century. Your concern was something that, uh, that has particular relevance to our times. Quite right. right. Do, you, do you find this in, in other kinds of, uh, of non-science fiction television or non-science fiction literature, for instance, that kind of relevance? Most television fiction that I watch has very little relevance. Uh, I think uh, it, it's one thing to say we will now have a program called Mod Squad, say, and we will have one black man and one Oriental and one Hawaiian to show this marvelous melting pot concept. But I think, Jim, that's altogether phony. I don't think that's, I think, at best condescension and at worst exploitation. Uh, the fact is that we have so distorted the pure ethnic minority over the years by making every black man a banjo player and a village idiot and a coward that suddenly we're going to reverse switch. He is now a brain scientist or an atomic scientist or, or any one of an equal distortion at the other end. Needless to say, I'd much prefer the distortion on the good, on the good side of the scale. But all, all television fiction I find quite irrelevant and quite unrelated. Arthur, so Arthur Clarke has said that he, he thinks that science fiction is the one completely realistic and relevant fiction that we have now. I think I'd In fact, to... that it deals, deals with contemporary problems. And indeed, it deals with the projection of what our contemporary problems are leading us to. Right. 2001, may I think, being a case in point here. Uh, Twilight Zone went on the air when? What? 1959 through 1962. And what was the reaction to it in <coughs> general? I mean, the first, the first year, what happened? Of course, you see, you have to gauge that in the strange arithmetic of television, which is very close to insanity. Uh, I think in its best run, Twilight Zone got roughly a 31 or a 32 share, which in television terms says that it is a mild success. It is not a runaway hit, it's not gun smoke, and it's a very questionable item as to whether or not we'll renew it if indeed something else comes along that looks much more publicly acceptable. It's sufficiently healthy to warrant their continuing to take a look at it. Now what that 31 share meant was approximately 25 million people watching which is a fair-sized audience. That's more than what Shakespeare, you know, during the first hundred years. But in the strange, again, as I say, the strange arithmetic of, tele arithmetic of television, this was not considered a major show. Oddly enough, the show became more popular after it went off the air, in terms of the name Twilight Zone being kind of interchangeable with you know, strange little witticisms throughout our language. It became a funny little uh, colloquialism that people used. It's still running, isn't it? It's and, running and intermittently all over yeah. the country and all over the world. It's been on 39 foreign stations, too. And I've seen it in Japan. There they call it the mystery zona. <laughs> and there I speak Japanese by moving my lips for two seconds and the voice continuing on for 32 minutes. And then it's done in pure Castilian Spanish and in several other languages. Uh, do you still get reactions from people oh, about yes, it? Indeed. I mean, uh, frequently. People, I yeah. still get, oddly enough, a massive amount of unsolicited material sent to me. <laughs> because it seems of all the writing milieu, the whole concept of fantasy and science fiction is that which appeals to the non-writer, at least the non-professional writer, the most. When Night Gallery went on the air, Jim, I bet I've received on the average of 100 pieces of mail per week with manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And of course, I can't entertain reading all of those things because of the legal hassle involved, and also by virtue of the fact that 99% of the writing that arrives on the desk of a mass media guy is pretty therapeutic writing. These are people who generally preface by saying, I ain't such a good writer, but uh, I got this real good idea in my dream after eating the rancid mayonnaise, and uh, I will let you write and we'll split this kind of thing. Uh, did you, were you pleased, uh, satisfied with what you did on, on The Twilight Zone, ultimately? I think overall, I think, uh, it, it lacked consistency. It wasn't a good show every week. It wasn't a good show sometimes three weeks running. But judging it on the basis of other television shows, I think we maintained a reasonable consistency. I think we had what I would also attribute to a show like Playhouse 90. We showed effort constantly. I think at times we showed ingenuity and creativity. I don't think we borrowed from anyone. I think we created more than we aped. You looked a lot, uh, I, I had the feeling, toward... Uh uh, published 
science fiction for inspiration. Was this on purpose no, or in desperation? No. Or? The, the, the first run, the first 35 weeks, I think the ratio was about maybe... You want to change magazines? Do you still... Okay. Do you still get reactions to Twilight Zone now that it's in syndication? Oh, yeah, Jim, because that's that marvelous phenomenon of television. It lends immortality, forgive me, to almost everything. And, of course, we go from generation to generation. The grammar school kid is now the, who first viewed television is now in college, and a brand new group is coming up. But we get considerable fan mail, and including, uh, oddly enough, uh, several manuscripts per week uh, offering to be done on Twilight Zone. Were you pleased with what you, uh, you did with the show? By and large, I think it failed in terms of its consistency. It was very good some weeks, quite bad other weeks, but this, I think, is pretty much the track record of most television by virtue of its desperate overexposure and the brevity of time allotted to us to produce something that is qualitative. But overall, I would say that it was a, a creative series. We, we did much more creating than we did imitating. I think we tried things, failed frequently, succeeded other times, but I think the mark of the show probably was the, I think, the quite perceivable attempted quality that went on in the show. And of course, in those days, we could get awfully skilled, consummately skilled performers who would work for 5000 per show, which may seem high, but which then the next year was dwarfed by guys getting 15 and 20. And I think our highest budget ever attained on the show was 70000 a week. Contrast that to Night Gallery, which is only twice as long, but which is coming in at approximately a quarter of a million dollars a week. That's what's happened to the spiraling costs of television. You went a lot uh, in, it seemed to me, uh, in the, the shows that I watched, to published fiction for a adaptation. Uh, was frequently. this on purpose? Oh, yeah, or? frequently. First of all, having to do them every week is a backbreaking job at best, and no man. Uh, least of all me, who was perhaps, as I said earlier, you know, the, perhaps the, the least adept of the science fiction writers, uh, no man could hope to create ingenious and novel plots. And, of course, the, the beauty of the whole science fiction genre was that so much of it had been untouched. It had been reproduced in, in printed form over and over again. You can buy, you know, any one of 4,000 anthologies per year and read all the best of Sturgeon and Hanlein and all the rest of it. But it had never been done on camera. So we had an, almost a gold mine of unused material that we could operate from. Which were you most pleased with, or which stick, stick out in your mind? Oddly uh, enough, the best sh I thought the two best shows we did, one I wrote, one I didn't write, uh, one was an original by Dick Matheson called uh, The Invaders mm -hmm. with uh, Agnes Moorhead, which was in a sense pure science fiction with a very O. Henry-ish twist. And the other was an adaptation of mine, a very free, loose adaptation, of a Lucille Fletcher, I think it was Lucille Fletcher, I could be wrong, a short story called Time Enough at Last, about a myopic bank teller who at the end, at the end of the world, breaks his glasses just when he's able to read all that he's ever wanted to read, which was sheer, pure, beautiful irony. And in terms of production values, when I, the adaptation I mentioned was gorgeously done. We used an MGM backlot with existing sets that were already there, and it looked like a movie. <laughs> Poor Dick Matheson, on the other hand, suffered what is really one of the clinical problems of doing science fiction on TV. This desperately required uh, eight-inch little men to walk across the floor of a room, and suddenly we are made aware of the fact that this woman who we thought was normal is actually an extraterrestrial giant, and the two men who are the invaders are actually really young American astronauts. So f all we could use, because we couldn't afford opticals and we couldn't afford uh, montage effects, were little wind-up rubber men. And, that's, and they walked precisely like little wind-up <laughs> rubber men. And I thought it totally destroyed the illusion and pointed out to me, you know, the desperate built-in problems of doing proper science fiction on television. What would you do differently today if you were going to produce a, another Twilight Zone? I would never try to shoot it in three days which was one of the hang-ups we had, I would get at least two days rehearsal for a cast. We had two to begin with, then it was cut to one, then we rehearsed on the set with no rehearsal time. Uh, that was the first thing. I would never try to beat my head against a wall trying to come in at what was an arbitrary budget at the, at the time. We simply couldn't do it properly. What we wound up doing was a, 
a, a very exuberant type of show, a very ambitious scoped show one week, and then have to suffer for it with one set drama for four weeks to pay off what we'd already done. And this, I think, lent a, a, a discrediting thing to the, uh, to the consistency of the quality of the show. In terms of story material, Jim, I don't think we would deviate very much from what we had already done. I thought we had some exceptionally good stuff on. And in the few years that have passed since Twilight Dawn was on, there has appeared another whole new generation, a new body of marvelous science fiction and fantasy that we could yet again draw on. What, uh, do you think uh, Twilight Zone had any impact upon later uh, science fiction television no. programs? Oddly enough, and usually you'll find that if anything's successful, as you know, on television, it's immediately aped and... Starship Troopers, uh, Poland, Kornblus, uh, the Space Merchants, which somebody should make into a film somehow. Yeah. All did the Twilight Zone have any influence on later television coverage of science fiction? I think not, Jim. Uh, in point of fact, in chronology, uh, One Step Beyond preceded us by one season. Uh, Outer Limits followed us, I think, two seasons later. Uh, there was one brief, altogether imitative show, which was a summer replacement produced by David Susskind, the name of which eludes me, which was a, an altogether failure. Uh, and then came Star Trek, but none of those shows were remotely imitative. Mm -hmm. They stood on their own feet or fell, whichever the case may be. Star Trek, I, we discussed it earlier privately, I thought was again a very inconsistent show, which at times sparkled with true ingenuity and pure science fiction approaches, and other times was more carnival-like and very much more the creature of television than the creature of a legitimate literary form. Uh, there was one previous show that was sort of the granddaddy of all the television science fiction, and this was done on the old DuPont network. Uh, gosh, I wish I could think of the name of it. I, I love this desperate knowledge of mine that I come out with. Uh, and this did a lot of marvelous adaptations, and some very good ones, the Adaptive Ultimate. Do you recall mm -hmm. that? Yes, yes. That, that was, was a, Stan, a Stanley, Stanley Weinbaum. That's right. And a story. very good show, yes, which I they did that. on that. I remember that. Uh, something About Tomorrow was in the title. Tales of Tomorrow, Tales that of was the name of the show, yes, produced right. by, uh, uh, by uh, Mort Abrams mm -hmm. on the old DuPont network, which I think later became ABC. But that truly was the granddaddy. But in terms of your question, no, very little imitation. I think what it did do was to supply, by virtue of its own moderate success, a kind of an entree to the darkness that surrounds us. Camera's rolling. What do you think, or... Where does, um, what did these, uh, these particular shows that were on other than yours, you think, did for science fiction? Or did for themselves, shall we say, in terms well, of Well, each fiction? by virtue of its own relatively moderate success, and all of them that we've mentioned were moderate successes, including The Invader, uh, I think simply uh, continued to prove a point which has to be proven to the network officialdom that science fiction can stand on its own. Uh, particularly in, an, in anthology form. And that, this, of course, was the beautiful, I thought, contribution of Twilight Zone. Uh, what I think we're seeing now, by virtue of the new two-hour feature film, that very often they are now dealing in science fiction, in the occult, and in fantasy. And, of course, now that we've dispensed with the shooting of pilots, the two-hour feature film serves in its stead. Rather than the pilot, they shoot a feature, and on the basis of the reaction to the feature, they decide whether or not they want to make it into a... A series. I've often felt er, that the, the, the hour and a half and two hour feature films turn to an unusual extent to science fiction, much more than, than do uh, feature films, for instance. And I've wondered whether there is a reason for this, whether by its very nature science fiction tends to get an audience for something which is untested, I don't untried. know. I can't answer that. I just don't know. At last he makes admission that he doesn't know. <laughs> What do you think the future of science fiction is on television? I have a fairly sanguine view of it, Jim. I, I think, hopefully, we're going to see a great deal more science fiction. I think at the moment it is being stultified by the current desperate economics of our place out there, that they're, they're being terribly timorous in all new areas of storytelling, only because it costs a buck. But I think this is uh, uh, very temporal. Uh, I think it's truly the only pure, fresh, area of a brand new storytelling form and fresh ingenious ideas that we have.
Do you think they're going to give creative people the opportunity to really be creative? I wish they would put science fiction into the hands of the science fiction men. Yeah. Uh, the unfortunate thing, and you've had to suffer through that disappointment yourself, is that they, they think it's sort of like uh, telling the story of a flagpole setter. And here we are, Jeffrey Ginsburg, your friendly flagpole setter. Do you think they'll ever give creative people a chance to be creative on television?